Welcome back. This is another episode of Light Beer, Dark Money. I'm Sean Noble, and Chris Clements is not here. Light Beer is not here, but Dark Money here. I've got a little solo rant today. Um, it is Thursday, July 14th. Last night was, I guess what being billed as the final debate for the U.S. Senate in the Republican primary. It was on Newsmax. Um, and it was a bit of a food fight between Jim Lehman and Blake Masters. And uh, in my humble opinion, I think Mick McGuire actually came out looking the best. Uh, Mark Brnovich was not in attendance, nor was Justin Olson. I kind of get the feeling that uh, Brnovich is, is pretty much just kind of written this off now. Um, he has dropped into third place based on three polls that came out recently. And um, I'm going to predict right now that it will, uh, that Mick McGuire, who has been polling at fourth, uh, is likely, I think, to perform better than Mark Brnovich when we get to elections. I think uh, Mick McGuire has been underperforming the polls. And we still have a tremendous number of people who are undecided. It's, you know, 30 plus percent. <clears throat> and so when you have polling that shows Blake Masters at, you know, 23, 22, and Jim Lehman, you know, in the mid teens or high teens perhaps, um, and then Bernovich at 10 or 12, and McGuire at six or seven, and 30 plus percent undecided. I mean, this thing's, it's not over. Um, I'd have to say Masters has got the the advantage, obviously, with the uh, president's endorsement. That's going to have some impact. President Trump is coming to Prescott on Saturday to do a rally uh, with his endorsed candidates. But the food fight in the Senate can uh, Senate campaign uh, pales in comparison to the food fight that's going on between. Kerry Lake and Karen Robeson with uh, Matt Salmon dropping out of the race. It's now a two person race. And um, Karen Robeson has made some, some impressive strides in tightening up the race. Kerry Lake continues to be in the lead in all the polling I've seen. And we'll see, you know, what happens. There's this, uh, there's a drag queen hit out on, uh, Carrie Lake. There's one that uh, uh, organization's doing that's actually the the person who is the drag queen on camera uh, talking about how Carrie Lake is a hypocrite. I got a mail piece from Karen Robeson uh, hitting Carrie Lake on the drag queen uh, messaging. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know how that'll play. Um, I don't know whether it changes any any votes or not. And uh, that's the challenge in this in this race with these two, is that there remain a pretty big number of undecideds, um, and you know because they're both kind of in the well. Carrie Lake I think is in the high 30s, and Karen Robeson's in the mid 30s, um, and that leaves a lot of room for people to make some last minute decisions. One thing I will say, and I think I've said this before, you know, early ballots went out. Um, so voting is happening and, uh, we, the returns I saw last or yesterday, uh, there were actually more Democrat ballots returned than Republican ballots, which is not a surprise to me because there's so many undecideds. I mean, you look at these lower level races and I say lower level, but down ticket races, secretary of state, uh, corporation commission, public and uh, superintendent, pu superintendent of public instruction, um, the number of undecideds is way, way high, uh, like 60%. So I think, as I've said in, in a number of occasions, for early, because I've been working in this business for a long time, we've been doing early balloting for 20 plus years, and one thing that I do know, and this is becoming more and more evident as time goes on, each cycle I think it gets later, uh, People who vote their ballot within the first week or so of getting it are not persuadable. 
they have already made up their mind. They're they're very informed. They're very active, and you know if you have if you have knowledge enough to fill out your entire ballot, as soon as you get it, you are probably not persuadable. So the campaign, you know, there's so many campaigns that really focus on the the run up to early ballots and then right around early ballots, and I just think that you still have to campaign pretty aggressively once early ballots have hit right up to election day. Um, and another thing that we saw this in 2020, there are a bunch of Republicans in particular who get their early ballot and then sit on it because they don't trust the mail. Uh, if you remember the, two, two, uh, the 2020 campaign, Trump really putting a lot of doubt on you know, mail, mail voting uh, and I think that's going to carry over again. We're going to have a ton, a ton of Republicans who walk their ballot into the voting booth to drop it off, which will then delay results. Because guess what? Those ballots weren't mailed in early. They didn't have the chance to get signature verified to then be opened and be prepped for counting. So they're going to get opened, signature verified after the election, and it's going to drag any race that's, at, you know, nominally close is going to take days to figure out. So if the governor's race is close uh, and you see a late surge for Karen Robeson, you, I, I think you're going to see a lot of claims of fraud and that kind of thing. So, oh, man, we can't get over this stuff. It's... Uh, it's a little bit maddening. It's a little bit maddening. Um, but the good news is, uh, for the most part, I think that the, the environment for Democrats continues to get worse. And there's some really interesting things that have happened of late. Um, one of the things that I, I found astounding, and this was in Axios Phoenix, if you're not uh, if you're not subscribed to that daily newsletter, uh, that's Jeremy Duda and Jessica Bowman. I don't know if I said that right, right. I apologize, Jessica, if I got it wrong. But uh, I've been, you know, I've followed Mike Allen, who was uh, the guy who started Political Politico Playbook. He left Politico, started Axios with another Politico guy, Jim Vandehei. And, um, and he does, Axios has a morning newsletter, and then they do Axios Local, and Phoenix just started in June. Um, but <clears throat> they had a story, and I'm going to take a second here to find it, about uh, Planned Parenthood, and that particularly Planned Parenthood action, that is their, their C4, the, the part that gets involved in the political side of things, um, Jessica Bohm, sorry, B-O-E-H-M. Follow her on Twitter. She's actually got some pretty fun stuff on there. Um, so Planned Parenthood versus police is what they say. The political arm of Planned Parenthood Arizona is requiring candidates to either reject or return contributions from law enforcement organizations in order to reduce, re receive an endorsement. Now, it strikes me as insane that... In the height of, you know, af in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court, this is a chance for Planned Parenthood to really broaden the tent and, and bring in supporters who uh, wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise be with them. And they're now saying, if you are running for office and you want our endorsement and you've gotten a check from uh, the police union, you have to return that check if you even want our endorsement uh, because they're so adamant on, I guess, defunding the police. I just find this astounding that the Democrats continue, the left continues to ruin things for Democrat candidates and make it harder and harder, I think, to, to reach out them to the mainstream. Another piece on this, as far as Democrats having a challenge with their normal or historical base. Uh, there's a poll out, New York Times Siena uh, poll that shows that in 
congressional races, the head to head, um, Hispanics split down the middle. They split between Republicans and Democrats in generic congressional balloting. Now, this is the astounding thing. In 2018, his Democrats had a 48% advantage, a 48-point advantage with Hispanic voters. And today, they're tied. That is a crushing blow for Democrat congressional candidates across the country where there's anyone, any district that has uh, any kind of semblance of Hispanic voters. And there are a lot of them. Um, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up here with this on this particular little rant, which is, it's, it's amazing to me. We have a situation in Arizona where we, <laughs> so there are nine congressional districts, right? The three most competitive races, I think, are uh, the race in the district where Tom O'Halloran is, Democrat, rural Arizona. Uh, the district where Ann Kirkpatrick is leaving in Tucson. Um, and then the Greg Stanton district here in Maricopa County. Uh, Biggs is safe, Lesko's safe, Gosar is safe. Schweikert is gonna be, you know, he's gonna win. I don't think that's gonna be all that competitive. Uh, obviously, Grijalva and Gallego are completely safe. They have hugely Democrat districts. So there's three competitive districts. In all three, the leading Republican candidate against the white, uh, well, Ann Kirkpatrick's not running again, but you have three districts represented by white Democrats, and the leading Republican candidates in those three districts are all minorities. There's two Hispanics. There's one, and I'm going to butcher the last name, Siskanami. Siskamami. Um, sorry, one. And Tanya Contreras Wheelis in the Stanton district. And then Walt Blackman, African American veteran, state legislator in the rural district uh, against O'Halloran. So you could see three minorities replace three white Democrats in the delegation, and then you put Gallego and Grijalva in that mix, that's five minorities to four non-minorities. Our, the Arizona Republican delegation, or I'm sorry, not the Republican delegation, the Arizona delegation as a whole will be a majority minority delegation. That's pretty awesome in my mind, particularly because three of those minorities, three of the five will be Republican. And that would also mean that there were seven Republicans and two Democrats from Arizona. So you heard it here first. Arizona being a trendsetter in Republicans reaching out to a more diverse audience than the Democrats who are becoming the party of the elite, white, educated, woke generation, I guess. And the working class and minority, not... You know, Republicans aren't going to win a majority of minorities, uh, although it might in Hispanics. So you see what's happening in Rio, Rio Grande Valley and also, you know, even here in Arizona. Uh, you know, it's going to be a long time before Republicans make enough inroads to the African-American community to win a majority there. But they don't have to win a majority to make things very difficult for Democrats. Um, so it will be interesting to watch. We'll get, we'll get through this primary uh, at the beginning of August, and then it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch as we see things happen here in Arizona, across the country, obviously with a 50-50 Senate. Every Senate race that's, in a, that's remotely competitive is going to be worth watching. And you know, I just don't think there's any doubt in my mind that the Republicans will recapture the House. Um, it's really a question of by what margin. And when you have uh, big money being reserved uh, by outside committees and NRCC in districts where Biden won by more than 10, uh, you know that things don't look good for Democrats uh, because that's a lot of districts putting it in the mix. I mean, I think it's up to 70 plus districts that are going to be competitive, competitive uh, as far as a lot of spending from uh, outside resources NRCC, Congressional Leadership Fund, and others. So 
hold on folks the next couple few months are going to be pretty interesting and we'll be here every week to uh try to make sense of it or not depends on how you uh how you look at where we are anyway thanks for listening have a great day